Okay. People are signing in, but we'll start. Good afternoon, bon après-midi. My name is Diana Rivington, and I'm a member of the McLeod Group. Let me begin by acknowledging that we are communicating in a non-traditional way from the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. Monday's federal budget was massive. Its English version is 739 pages and it's spending unprecedented. And as a vintage feminist, I must attest to the decades of organizing and advocating uh, by women across Canada, pushing for Monday's turning point for accessible, affordable, high quality, early learning and childcare. But today I welcome the over 200 of you who have linked in for the panels being sponsored by the group of 78 and the McLeod group, hot takes on the federal budget. Where are we going with the feminist foreign policy? Your moderator, Gauri Srinivasan, is policy and campaigns director at Nature Canada, where she advocates on issues of biodiversity, climate, and equity. And she's worked for many years on international cooperation, trade and human rights policy, and on Parliament Hill. Bienvenue, Gauri. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, long fan of the group of 78 and also of the McLeod group. So, Christia Freeland, a finance minister who was a foreign affairs minister and a trade minister and is now deputy prime minister. Perhaps no one better placed to understand the fundamental linkages between our national federal budget priorities and international policy outcomes. And a feminist to boot who even has the t-shirt. Today should be lots of fun. We have an eminent panel of experts who are going to give their hot takes on the budget that handed out cool billions to a lot of issues from childcare to nature protection. The hour I think is going to fly by, so fasten your seatbelts. Here's how it's going to work. Uh, our panelists will each offer brief insights, they have five minutes, into what the budget had to say for a different aspect of international policy and how this fits or doesn't fit a Canadian feminist foreign policy agenda. A warning to our speakers, I have been asked to enforce the time allocation, so I'm going to give you a four minute mark when that means you have one minute left, so please watch for that. Then, dear audience, it'll be your turn. We'll go to you. Uh, we'll have a question and answer period for about 20 to 25 minutes. You will see the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. So please feel free to start populating the feed at any time with your questions once the panelists have begun. You can also vote in support of others' questions to move them up the queue. La discussion sera en anglais, mais les questions ou commentaires en français sont très bienvenus. Et on va faire un, une traduction rapide pour les panelistes. After the panel and after the discussion with all of you, uh, the questions from the audience with the panelists, we'll have a wrap-up session with Roy Culpepper from the group of 78, who will comment on what we've heard today. A big thank you in advance to Sarah Holes from the group of 78 for our technical support that she's providing to us. So uh, I will introduce each panelist in turn as they speak. And to kick us off, I'm going to call on Laura McDonald, a professor of political science at Carleton University, to talk to us about what the budget had to say about trade. Laura? Hi, thanks very much, Gary, and thanks to the organizers. It's great to be here. I should start by saying that the budget does not say an awful lot about trade, as is normal for budgets. It's not usually a big element of the budget process but I think we can read some stuff into this budget. And just because there's not a lot on trade, I just wanted to say something sort of big picture. Um, so I guess a question could be, what does this budget, or does this budget represent another nail in the coffin of the Washington consensus? So I noted an article, you probably can't see this, uh, in the uh, ROB on Tuesday by Conrad Yakubuski, a noted conservative commentator, titled The Washington Consensus is Over, Ottawa's budget shows how Western governments have ditched previous beliefs about free markets. 
However, if uh, we look at the content of the uh, budget document, uh, which doesn't say a lot about trade, um, it seems like the uh, whoever is in charge of Canada's international trade uh, policy hasn't really got this memo about the Washington consensus being over. I should note that the Washington consensus included, you know, uh, commitment to free trade as an economic driver, in addition to elements like um, reducing budget deficits, which does seem to be um, seeing a big shift in this uh, budget, um, at least for Canada. So there is a lot of language in this budget that seems to reaffirm Canada's commitment to free trade and existing approaches to trade. And um, feminist uh, scholars of trade and gender and of international trade in general um, would take issue with this uh, failure to pay attention to issues around trade and gender um, and would insist that trade is not gender neutral and uh, uh, existing trade policy will not have a positive impact on women and gender diverse people and other um, uh, marginalized groups um, unless measures are taken to address deeply entrenched gender inequalities um, and, and unless this is done, often uh, policies will just end up reinforcing those inequities. And a, there was, has been an ongoing process uh, of consultation with civil society about Canada's feminist foreign policy. And uh, I can put some links to those documents in the, in the chat later, but uh, it, uh, those, that consultation process has underlined the idea that um, we need a coherent feminist approach. There needs to be policy coherence across different elements of Canada's international relations, include, including trade policy, sustainability, climate change, diplomacy, et cetera. So it's not enough to just look at the international assistance policy to make it a foreign, uh, a feminist foreign policy. We need to do more. Um, but it also requires coherence across international and domestic policy. So in that regard, elements of these policies that are adopted in the budget, especially the commitment to a national daycare po program to be rolled out over the years is extremely positive. And I think uh, will address the situation of Canadian women who have been the hardest hit by the pandemic and could, could um, help Canadian women um, who are involved in international trade, either as entrepreneurs who are trading or uh, as women in, um, working in um, uh, elements of the economy that are uh, traded, they, that could have a positive impact on their capacity to reap benefits from Canadian trade relations. Um, but I think we need to go farther in order to ensure that that happens. So um, in, in terms of specific elements in the, in the budget uh, that do relate to trade, there is a mention, for example, of uh, procurement op opportunities and increasing diversity in procurement. Uh, so it says um, to, to do that um, and economically empower historically disadvantaged businesses, um, improve fairness and procurement opportunities. The budget uh, pro uh, provides uh, 87, oh my God. Um, uh, a lot of money for procurement around diversity doesn't even mention gender though as an aspect of diversity that should be taken into account. And one more element I'll mention now is uh, the mention of the uh, core, the uh, Canadian Ombudsperson for Responsible Enterprise that is mentioned in the budget and there's a commitment of 16 million over five years to support this uh, agency that's supposed to ensure ethical, social and environmentally responsible practices of Canadian corporations operating abroad. Um, but there's no change in the uh, powers of that agency to um, actually enforce those processes rather than just um, encouraging more ethical processes, including paying attention to the gender impact of uh, Canadian opera, uh, corporate activities abroad. So I'll just stop there. Thank you.
Thank you, Laura. That was perfectly timed. And now to cover the area of international cooperation and aid policy, Stephen Brown, Professor of Political Studies at the University of Ottawa. Great. Thank you, Gary. Let me start by saying I find it really hard to understand the financial data in the budget, or at least on areas related to foreign aid. What I'm going to be talking about is mainly from the section called Building a Safer, Resilient and Equitable World. Uh, it's not only foreign aid. Um, it does mention $1.4 billion in international assistance over five years, but not all of that is what can be classified as official development assistance. The biggest or one of the biggest increases under that category is for Canada's as an extension of Canada's Middle East strategy, which actually can include security and counterterrorism money to national defense and um, spy agencies. And maybe Peggy will be talking more about that. I don't know. So, so that was point number one. I've got six points. Point number two, um, the current COVID crisis has reversed years, if not a decade or more, of development progress around the world. And this is not something that can just be fixed in a year or two. Looking at the budget's content around foreign aid, there's no real sign of re-engagement, medium or long-term commitment. There's, there's really just an increase in short-term assistance. And if you look at the figures, it actually seems like it will shrink later on. Canada is already a laggard when it comes to uh, generosity uh, compared to other OECD countries, and that will not change. There, there's a bit of a blip. Um, there was an increase for 2020. There will be an increase for 2021, but it looks like after that it will fall again. Third point, interesting that Laura brought up the Washington consensus because something that really struck me is that most of the initiatives that are named in the budget are multilateral and very Washington consensus associated multilateral. So money to the World Bank, money to the IMF, um, also to the African Development Bank, uh, very much oriented towards loans, uh, money for the private sector, um, recapitalizing Canada's development finance institution, FINDEV Canada, uh, more and more, Canada is financing international assistance through loans. Last year, 10% of the contributions were loans, and that will probably go up. This is in the context of a new debt crisis um, that COVID has just accelerated. Um, so, so that is of concern, I would say. I won't mention the ombudsman because uh, or ombuds person because Laura already has, but. Looking at that section, it felt to me like it could have been written by the Conservatives under Harper. There, there didn't seem to be any um, sense that this was something that the Liberals were doing that was any different. And what struck me also was that it seemed like uh, a lack of trust in Global Affairs Canada's ability to engage in long-term development and also the civil society partners if, if so many, so much of this is checks being written to multilateral organization. Okay, that was the third point. Fourth point, and I think I'll have to accelerate, a huge focus on humanitarian assistance. Um, it names some initiatives like the Rohingya refugees and the Venezuela crisis. Unclear why it just sort of threw them in and made it seem a little bit like signature projects. But with those and the overall increase to humanitarian assistance, it gives the impression or it makes me wonder what the commitment is to medium and long term structural change to reduce or eliminate poverty rather than um, rather than just meet immediate crisis needs. I see you, Gowrie. Thank you. Um, fifth point, uh, where does this take us in the, the feminist foreign policy? In this section, there's only one mention of women, um, that FinDev Canada will economically empower women, and only one mention of gender, uh, a mention of gender responsive humanitarian assistance. This was, to me, very surprising, because usually uh, our statements go very much in the opposite direction. It's way, actually, too much, I would say, women, girls, women, girls, women, girls, women, and girls. Um, uh, and FIAP itself, the Feminist International Assistance Policy, is not mentioned in the section, only in Annex 4. So let me sum up, which is my sixth point. So I would say overall this is disappointing. There's some extra short-term money, but not enough to um, really deal with the enduring COVID-related crisis, which will not be over for most of the world at the end of this year or even next year. 
Um, not enough for a longer, broader uh, re-engagement. There isn't much demonstration of leadership or partnerships that are worthy of the feminist international assistance. And as I mentioned, the focus on humanitarianism makes me wonder if the Canadian government still believes in the importance of long-term development. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. And now uh, to address the issue of diplomacy and foreign policy more broadly, we have Bianca Ujeni, who is the director of the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute. Thank you, Gowrie. Thanks so much to the McLeod Group and the Group of 78 for hosting. Um, it's, it's great to be here. So a lot has already been made of the federal government's commitment of up to $30 billion over five years to get a national childcare program off the ground, but less has been said about their plan to move forward with a $19 billion fighter jet purchase um, in what would be the second most expensive government procurement program ever. Um, $19 billion is a massive sum, and that's just the sticker price. A recent report released by the No Fighter Jets Coalition estimates that the full life cycle cost of purchasing 88 new warplanes is actually $77 billion. So while the funding for childcare is so excellent to see, it's important to highlight that there's a whole other $77 billion that could be used for socially useful projects or to promote peace and human rights or feminist foreign policy. As we speak, there's actually a rolling fast to reject Canada's plans to purchase these jets, um, arguing that they're useless in helping us cope with real changes um, ahead, like droughts or floods, um, the global pandemic, or even a 9-11 style attack. Um, and the fast also honors those who've been killed in, uh, in Canadian warplanes, and that's something that I participated in last weekend. Um, what they are useful for is fighting in U.S. and, and NATO-led wars. So, you know, this is a little bit more about Canada being part of American empire and less to do with having an independent foreign policy. Um, additional problematic priorities, the, the budget allocates 10 times more money to the military than to environment and climate change Canada. And put another way, uh, as the climate crisis deepens, the Liberals appear 10 times more concerned about the military then environment. Um, they like to talk a lot about feminism, but the budget suggests that they're more strongly committed to a patriarchal institution that's focused on US and, and NATO-led missions. Um, the 2021 budget has a, a section devoted to the Liberals' plans to increase Canada's contribution to NATO. Um, and Ottawa has been quite an aggressive proponent of the nuclear armed alliance and currently leads uh, missions in Latvia. And I think we just need to push and question our further contributions to, to this alliance. Um, there's a clash between the funds that will go to nuclear armed NATO and a feminist foreign policy or feminist budget. And we can see that in a disappointing move, Canada refused to join 122 countries represented at the 2017 UN conference to negotiate a nuclear ban treaty. And it's safe to say a major reason that they haven't signed is their commitment to NATO. Um, the TPNW went into force on January 22nd. It's a beacon, um, given, the given the dangers of nuclear weapons, but Canada haven't signed and incredibly haven't done so while asserting that they're committed to a world free of nuclear weapons uh, and also claim to want to advance uh, feminist foreign policy and an international rules-based order. So there's a further hypocrisy here because the TPNW has been dubbed the first feminist law on nuclear weapons, recognizing the disproportionate impact of nuclear weapons on, on women and girls. And it also strengthens the international rule-based order by making these weapons that have always been immoral, also illegal. Uh, moving on to mining, the government announced $16 million for corporate mining ombudsperson. In theory, this is positive. However, this role is largely toothless um, and doesn't have the power to compel companies um, to provide documents, for instance, and isn't empowered to sanction corporate abusers. So failing to make good on their promise to rein in Canadian mining abuses abroad really undercuts liberal feminist foreign policy, as things like sexual assault often plague communities near Canadian-run mines. Women are also disproportionately burdened by the ecological destruction caused by mining. Uh, moving on to Venezuela, it's, it's named, um, as was mentioned in the budget, Canada is going to be providing $80.3 million to respond to the Venezuelan migrant and refugee crisis. The budget references Canada's key role in international efforts to find solutions here. Um, given Canada's involvement in regime change efforts and leadership of the Lima Group, it's, it's very important to keep an eye on where this money goes, specifically that it doesn't go to continued regime change efforts. It's also important to remember that Venezuelan refugees aren't part victims 
of Canada's sanctions. So let's keep asking these important questions. Why is Canada leading the Lima Group and involved in efforts to overthrow Venezuela's UN-recognized government, a clear violation of the principle of non-intervention in other countries' internal affairs, and does Canada's sanctions policy respect international law? Um, uh, another example in Haiti regarding the intersections between diplomacy and aid, Canada needs to be very careful. The, the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute, where I worked, released a public letter calling on Trudeau to end support for a repressive, corrupt Haitian president devoid of constitutional legitimacy after Jovenel Moïse unconstitutionally extended his mandate in February, followed by massive protests. Um, in 2020, the Canadian government gave $12.5 million in operational support to the Haitian police as part of uh, the feminist aid policy, FIAP. It, it is, in fact, Haiti's Canadian-trained and funded police force that has sustained the repressive, illegitimate Jovenel Moïse as president. Um, and since the popular uprising began in July 2018 against Moïse, the police have killed dozens without criticism, any criticism from the Trudeau government. So it's very difficult to see how funding the Haitian police is feminist or how it benefits women. Um, it's a repressive apparatus which has been implicated in all kinds of abuses, including massacres, and this is not how we want to be spending on diplomacy. So in light of our second consecutive Security Council defeat last summer, it's clear we need a fundamental reassessment of Canadian foreign policy. Uh, we need a spirit of internationalism to generate the goodwill that's required to actually come together with other countries to overcome these overlapping cr global crises of inequity, climate change, the pandemic, and the threat of nuclear weapons. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Bianca. Oh, there, I'm, my microphone is active now. Uh, we have pinned up the... We're having trouble hearing you, so maybe I should just start. You're, you're freezing, Gory. Go ahead. Thank you, thank you uh, very much. Um, uh, the first, uh, my my topic is uh, is the defense uh, budget, and uh, the first go on, go on. the first point to note for context in June 2017, the government of Canada announced a new defense policy, strong, secure, engaged, which included a whopping 70 percent increase in uh, defense spending over 10 years, with the biggest incremental increases not coming until uh, fiscal year 21, 23, 24 and following. To put that into context, compare the defense budget at the time of that announcement of 19 billion and the current defense budget of 25 billion. The second key point is that up to the end of 2019, the latest figures I've been able to get, DND has not spent all of its allocated annual funding in the amount of $2 billion for the fiscal year 2018-19, for example. And this money under the new accounting system launched by Secure, Strong, Secure, Engage, but does not lapse, but goes back into the defense budget. So that's to set the context. Ever-increasing annual budgets and not able to spend all the money annually. Now for the main event, as I said, the current budget, which includes substantial increases in DND spending for the next five years, beginning in this fiscal year. I should note, because of Bianca's comments about fighter jets, there's nothing in terms, I mean, it's the status quo on fighter jets. They're still going through procurement. There's no, uh, you know, there's no money allocated in this budget, be, uh, additional monies allocated. So the new money allocated 236.2 million over five years uh, to address the ongoing crisis of sexual assault and violence in the ranks. Of course, in the media, often of late, the budget recommits the government to creating a new external, new external oversight mechanisms for people who report sexual assault in the military. I mean, as a lawyer, that is the absolute fundamental precondition to 
getting this problem solved, an independent mechanism that is not under the military chain of command. That has been thrice promised now, but we'll see and we hope, there's money there, that it will materialize. Uh, continuing with the substantial increases, 163 million over five years for the modernization of continental defense, including 111 million uh, for NORAD uh, modernization. <clears throat> I'll come back to that in a minute. 80, 847 million to maintain Canada's rotating deployments of frigates and fighter jets to NATO. So there is that uh, mention of the fighter jets and more cash to increase contributions to NATO's military alliance budget. So we're increasing our contribution there. And a $527 million uh, increase for one year only. Most of the increases I've mentioned have been over five years to extend for one more uh, year, and this is the month, this is where CSIS comes in. The, the 527 million in 21-22 fiscal year is to be split among DND, Global Affairs, CSIS, and uh, CSE, so two intelligence agencies, for extending our Middle East strategy for another year, whatever that might be. Um, the, the part we know best is the Canadian military training that we've offered in Iraq, um, and therefore the assumption is that the lion's share of that money is going to D&D, but I guess the intelligence agencies are going to get some of it to, uh, to do their, their work. But the, but, these, but the important thing to note here is that these budgetary additions do not bring D&D's annual spending over or even up to the projected amount of $25 billion uh, for this year, which was set out in the SSE announced in 2017. And that's according to the main estimates tabled by the government earlier this year. And of course, there'll be supplementary estimates adding additional costs. That always happens. And therefore, it's expected that that will bring it up to the amount forecast for this year, 25 billion. So new, new announcements, but we're not going to be um, going over the forecasted in the 2017 uh, defense, new defense policy, the forecasted amount of 25 billion, 315 million for this year. But bear in mind that represents a billion dollar increase over last year amidst over ongoing increases. But the tiny bit of good news is, is that there are no increases beyond the approximately 1 billion from the previous year that's already established. There's also another very noteworthy point, and that is the amount allocated to NORAD, 111 million over 15, five years, is very modest. This was a topic of, of discussion in the first virtual meeting between Trudeau and Biden. And the estimates of the actual cost for NORAD modernization are 11 to 15 billion, with Canada expected to be responsible with 40% of the cost and the Americans picking up 60%. So, as you can see, the 111 million is a, is a tiny amount. And this a huge expenditure for NATO modernization was not included in the 2017 um, new defense policy. And so experts think that the government would likely expect DND to find the money within existing resources, and the small amount allocated in the budget seems to confirm that assumption. Another really piece of good news is that the focus of the money is on Canada's niche area of domain awareness through technological upgrades to the North Warning System and not on Canada joining the latest version of the American Strategic Ballistic Missile Defense boondoggle, despite renewed efforts of the Canadian defense lobby. But the bad news is, is that but this budget is business as usual uh, with planned increases pre-pandemic uh, in, def uh, in defense policy still going ahead. This stands in direct contradiction to the clarion call within Canada and around the world for a collective rethinking of security, a pandemic pivot, a global human security reset, call it what you will. Uh, quoting uh, Dr. Michael Ryan from the World Health Organization Health Emergency Program, when this is over, meaning the pandemic, we need to sit down and see what kind of society we want to have in future. 
Are we to be defended from foreign armies or are we to be defended from viruses? Where are we putting our investment in society, our civilization and our way of life? Peggy, I'm just, we, we, we'll need to wrap up and move okay. to the speaker. Okay, yeah. so. The that was a big powerful ending though. <laughs> yeah, so the conclusion is that um, nowhere is the pandemic pivot more urgent than, than in realigning spending in accordance with the real existential threats facing Canada, naming, namely climate ca catastrophe, the destruction of nature, and nuclear Armageddon. Armageddon. And a tangible example of this rethink would be rather than in sending more money to NATO's military budget, giving more money to diplomatic efforts focused on NATO to reduce nuclear risks. That would be a defense budget in accordance with a feminist foreign policy which promotes sustainable peace and common security. Thank you. Thank you, Peggy. Um, uh, very helpful overview. Um, Angela, the gauntlet is down for you to try and wrap us up in good time. Uh, absolutely lost, last but not least, uh, a consideration of the global environment from Angela Keller Herzog, former Green Party candidate and coordinator of CAFES. Angela. Thanks very much, um, Gauri. And thank you to all the organizers for including environment um, on the radar screen um, of this budget analysis. Um, without the land, the water, the air, the fellow creatures, large and small, we humans don't really have a leg to stand on. And many people are starting to recognize that without the ecological base and without that ecological base not being in crisis, um, or, or completely destabilized, humans are really in trouble. And, and it's clear that with the global climate crisis and with the biosphere um, crisis, um, we, we are in trouble. So how, how does this relate to the budget? Well, the premise, the whole premise of budget 2021 and the fiscal stabilization post COVID is growth. So there is a problem if we humans are organizing ourselves, our consumption, our production on the premise of limitless growth. Um, this will obviously end up destroying the ecological niche that we live in. Um, and if this apple cart is already wobbly, then we're just driving towards the tipping point, towards the cliff. I think that Canada should do as New Zealand has done and that the yardstick on the budget allocations should be based on increases in wellness rather than limitless increases in GDP growth, which can then afford for more debt and yet more, yet more, yet more. So let's unpack the, the budget a little bit more. And, and actually I have a, a, a foreshadowing here. It's not all terrible news. Um, so we're looking at over 700 pages of this and that and this and that, and there's something in there for every voter, as they say. But I would like to point out a big um, section um, where there is something really big and new in this budget. Um, I think that the Liberals have actually drawn a line in the sand where the budget makes a commitment for conserving 25% of our lands and our oceans by 2025. And they put some money behind that as well. So there's 2.3 billion over five years. Um, and this is historic for Canada. And I think that that deserves a big bravo. And that also is, is linked, right, to that perspective that I drew out earlier about us living in our ecological niche and needing to do some maintenance on that. So let's uh, dig some more into this budget. Oh, dig, dig, did I say? Let's talk about climate then. Um, we know that in the six years that the Liberals were first elected, Canada has failed to reduce our emissions. We have increased public hands out to, handouts to big oil. We've delivered climate plans that are half as ambitious as are needed um, under the IPCC scenarios. And we've fallen short on a just transition for oil and gas workers and support for frontline communities. So is this budget turning that ship? Do we actually stop digging? And on balance, I, I'm afraid I have to say no. 
Um, there's been a fantastic amount of lobbying by the combined oil, gas, financial, and business sector, while COVID has been preoccupying the rest of us. And this lobby has moved from climate denial to delay, to deflection and distraction. So what do the numbers look like? The Canadian scale of ambition, though historic for Canada, um, over seven years of gre so-called green recovery, we've got 17.6 billion. It still falls very short of the ambition that we would need if we were to meet the targets. Um, and it falls very short if we want to do our share internationally. We are increasing subsidies to the oil and gas sector and to the large polluters. And the recent um, announcements, especially for the net carbon accelerator fund, um, are focused on the high polluters, the high emitters. The budget speaks of decarbonizing our industrial facilities. Um, and the budget is a fan of the carbon capture utilization and storage technologies, which are basically unproven technologies. So net zero can be a clever way of saying that we can put carbon into the atmosphere as fast as we're taking it out. I'll just wrap up there. So investing in technology that works to bring us to a low carbon path, that would be turning the ship. But giving large subsidies to large polluters on unproven technologies, um, let's keep an eye on that and let's question that whenever we see it because that isn't gonna get us to where we need to go. Thanks. Thank you very much. Just a big round of jazz hands for all our panelists. That was a lot of stuff to get through, 700 pages. I know you didn't read all the chapters and a really helpful overview uh, with insights into various aspects of international policy. There's quite a few um, questions lined up in the queue, uh, but definitely at the top from at, uh, um, at least seven of our listeners, Stephen, is a question that will kick off with you, although others uh, may have uh, an interest in commenting. And the question is uh, posed this way. I'm interested to learn more about Canada's lack of trust for global affairs to really engage in long-term development and long-term development partners. Can you comment on why you think that is? Okay, let me preface what I'm going to say by it's speculative. I have no crystal ball. I haven't bugged any offices. Um, so I, I don't have any definitive statements, but I can I can tell you what my impression is for sure. One is that um, the Liberal Party is not that committed to international development. Um, certain people are, I believe the current minister is, Karina Gould, but um, when Christia Freeland, for instance, was a minister at GAC, she did not demonstrate a great commitment to um, international development. The same would go for Justin Trudeau. I would say our, our, our politicians are very good at saying the right things, but they don't follow it up by putting their money where their mouth is. And I think that was visible even in 2015 before the elections when asked about increasing the foreign aid budget. And if I remember, remember correctly, Justin Trudeau and others said, and this seemed to be a talking point, that it was not realistic in the current fiscal context to increase the aid budget. And of course, you know, suddenly we found, however it is, 200 million, 200 billion, 300 billion to, for COVID, but we couldn't find an extra 1 billion, 2 billion for foreign aid. So I think there's a lack of commitment there. I noticed that Belinda Dodson put in the um, in, in the Q&A section, um, some speculation about PCO ignoring GAC budget requests. Um, there's that, and, and I would extend that to uh, Finance Canada as well as not considering it very important. And I think uh, it's also worth mentioning that there's been a hollowing out of capacity at GAC, which has been, uh, which started under the Conservatives when, it, when we still had CETA and has continued. So there's, a, a, in a sense, if they don't trust their own department, it's not just because the department has, uh, is not good or the people there are not good, it's that it's been deliberately hollowed out of expertise over a period of at least 15 years. Thanks, it's interesting because the comment is about the, the contrast with the UK and other countries that seem to be actually kind of strengthening their um, the budget and therefore the muscle for their international policy. 
Uh, we can come back to that later, but let's look at some of the other questions. Uh, on trade, Laura, a question for you, interested in to hear your thoughts uh, about the gender and trade chapters in bilateral agreements, for example, with Chile or Israel. How do you see those, effective or not? Thanks. Um, thanks, Laura Parisi. Um, Yes, yeah, so the, I, I would give uh, Global Affairs and the Trade Ministry um, specifically credit for pushing the envelope on trying to think about how to integrate gender concerns in trade agreements. Um, and so they have been amongst the pioneers in, in developing these uh, gender chapters, such as in the Canada-Chile agreement, although I would note it was basically a copy-paste of the Chile-Uruguay agreement, so they didn't. it's not like they invented the language. Um, it came, I think, particularly from Chile. Um, so, you know, having a gender chapter is great to call attention to the links between gender and trade, which have never been obvious to your average trade economist or uh, trade professional. Um, but the critiques of them are that, um, you know, they're, they're sort of expressing goodwill around these issues, promoting sort of exchange of best practices between the two or more partners of the agreement, uh, but don't contain um, mechanism, mechanisms for enforcement of those measures, unlike almost every other aspect of a trade agreement, which does include enforcement measures. Mm -hmm. Um, but I would also say that there has been move in um, global affairs to move towards greater mainstreaming of gender concerns into other chapters uh, more recently after those, uh, like the Chile agreement was signed. So they, you know, they're doing a lot of work to try to think about how it, to do this, but there are some, still some weaknesses. Um, so for example, they're thinking about, well, for sure, labor, labor rights includes concern about Har harassment of, of women at work and so forth, which is great. And that may be the most effective way to promote these types of concerns. Um, but the, my concerns would still be, um, we don't have these agreements with our biggest trade partners. So, you know, uh, Trump opted to not include a gender chapter, not surprisingly in the renegotiated NAFTA. We don't want have one in our agreement with the EU or CPTPP. Uh, which are major trade agreements. So we just have them in our smaller agreements. When, when uh, the Canadian government evaluates the impact of trade agreements on uh, women, and it's only on, basically on women, it's not a very intersectional analysis, um, they're only looking at Canadian women, not the impact on, say, Chilean women, um, which is just the, the way that trade departments tend to operate. They don't look at the impact of other on other countries um, because of all the push around making sure Canadians don't lose jobs. Um, but that's a very parochial kind of perspective. And uh, the, the focus tends to be on promoting um, participation of women owned or indigenous and black owned small businesses um, in trade opportunities rather than looking at the broader impact of trade agreements on women workers or or just um, consumers or, or women in, in the society at large. Thank you, uh, Laura. We have a question from Sudan's ambassador to Canada, Tariq Absuli. Thank you very much for joining. Um, the question is that Canada is a prominent country in empowering women and Sudan women play a key role in the political life. Uh, we have four women ministers in government, including foreign minister. How can um, Sudan benefit more from Canada's experience? How do we help empower women in Sudan to enable them to participate in the political scene, especially with respect to elections which are approaching? So a question about women's participation in political life, particularly electoral democracy. Um, Bianca, can I start with you? Sure, thank you for the question. Um, so I'm, one of the things that I, I have noted is that women are at the forefront of the protests in Sudan. And I think that, you know, they should be celebrated and I think that should be acknowledged by the, by the Canadian government um, and, and sort of brought to the forefront. I think that's one way in which, um, the, you know, Canadian government can help. I think, I think sometimes, um, I think sometimes our feminist foreign policy also speaks volumes not necessarily through things that we do, but things that we stop doing, right? And so, um, well, things like 
additional contributions to the ADB are wonderful. I feel as though we're in this very intense time in history where um, saying that we have a feminist foreign policy, saying that we support um, women in Africa uh, isn't enough. Um, I think that um, people, it's very hard to take this seriously when we haven't done the concrete things of ensuring that our foreign policy as feminist truly means a focus on peace and human rights and overcoming global inequities. And it's just very important um, for us to assess it every turn what changes are actually being implemented and a couple of the things that I had highlighted um, really a huge part of it is um, you know is demilitarization you know this really is one of the most important aspects of a, of a feminist foreign policy um, joining the rest of the world you know and signing the TPNW ending public support for arms exports you know uh, not arming patriarchal monarchies bringing in real restraints on Canadian mining. I feel like these are the types of things that really build international support and cooperation, which we're going to need um, if we're going to overcome these global crises. But obviously, more specifically, I think really just celebrating and telling the stories um, of what is happening in Sudan and, and how women are, are really leading the way. I was muted. Peggy, go ahead. Do you want to take that one too? Yes. I, well, I just wanted to jump in to say, and it sort of ties in with the trade aspect, with the aid aspect. And that is, of course, one of the things that uh, CETA used to be extremely good at was funding uh, local NGOs in countries. And they, of course, are the ones that help empower the women. So it's not externally being done from the outside, which rarely works. It's empowering uh, local women's organizations within the country. So, um, so that really ties back into the argument about how we need to rebuild our, our, aid, our aid capacity because giving money to multilateral organizations has its place. But here's an example where Canadian capacity to, uh, to empower local, local women's groups would, would make a tangible difference or could make a tangible difference. Thank you, Peggy. I think also another thing kind of to add, I'm sneaking into the queue when we think about what are the measures to strengthen women's participation, it's often um, less the direct, how did you do it in another country, but thinking about what are the things that reduce women's barriers to participation fully in economic and political life locally. So key issues around access to health, education, um, uh, action on gender violence, uh, things that make women's lives more straightforward and easy for them to participate. As Bianca is saying, they are already at the forefront indicating they have lots of ideas and ways to participate. So it's often about reducing uh, the barriers that are very uh, already clear inside, inside countries and local organizations can play a key role in that. I don't know, Stephen, if you'd like to comment, there's an interesting kind of discussion in the Q&A session about uh, whether Canada stands in contrast to the UK and the US in terms of strong new visions for diplomacy, defense, or development. Professor Ruckert, I still have to think of him as my professor. I can't call him Arne yet. <laughs> is uh, uh, is um, indicating that there's been a lot of aid cuts in, uh, in the UK. So how would you say Canada is faring with respect to kind of comparison to other um, OECD countries? It's hard to say because everything is in flux and, you know, the UK was such a beacon of, you know, long term poverty reduction, separating um, development goals from self interested uh, foreign policy. And that has changed um, in the past year or so. They have radically cut their um, aid budget, integrated it with their foreign office, just like we did when CETA joined what was then DFAT-D or became DFAT-D, now GAC. Um, but it's important to remember that even with all those cuts, they're still giving 0.7% of their gross national income to foreign aid, whereas Canada is currently about 03 uh, in part because of the recent boost in foreign aid and the drop in gross national income. Um, and that will draw Brian. Notice Brian Tomlinson is is on this call. He's done some calculations, and um, in the next few years, 
Canadian, as, as GNI goes up and ODA goes down, our ratio will go down. I think his projections are around 0 0.21. So um, many bad things are happening in the UK, but in terms of generosity, they're still you know twice as generous as Canada. Then the US, it's also very much in flux with the transition from Trump to Biden. So I don't really want to talk about that. But what, what I do think is, is interesting is that, well, the UK didn't necessarily do a good job, but they've done an integrated review. And the weird thing about Canada is that our feminist international assistance policy was done in isolation from the rest of our foreign policy. And it's like we put all the feminism there. And we threw some words around about we have a feminist trade policy or you know feminist defense policy. Um, some of the interventions here today have made it pretty clear that that's a stretch to call these things feminist. But our integrated review is sort of happening now. Um, so it'll be interesting to see when this comes out, perhaps in the next couple of months, what that will say and how it meshes with the feminist international assistance policy, which was adopted um, almost four years earlier. Uh, Laura. Um, yeah, just in terms of comparing us with other countries, I thought something important to mention around trade is that when Sweden adopted, adopted a feminist foreign policy, they banned um, arms sales to Sweden, which was extremely controversial. Canada, of course, uh, sorry, to um, Saudi Arabia, <laughs> uh, which was extremely controversial, but it was justified partly in terms of violations of rights of, of women in Saudi Arabia. We did just ban arms sales to Turkey, which was good, um, but we have not moved ahead on, uh, on other, you know, more deep evaluation of our arms sales. Around the U.S., I just wanted to mention the U.S. Is, um, has offered something like $4 billion to address the, the causes of the refugee crisis in Central America. And we've Canada's been asked to help with that as well uh, by Mexico. And uh, the United States has, asked, has indicated they're going to be coming to Canada. Um, but instead, we devoted money to the Venezuelan crisis, but I'm not necessarily a opposed to doing that, but I think we should also be considering that aspect. And one final thing I wanted to mention in terms of our international commitments around trade is uh, the need to consider a waiver to the TRIPS agreement around production of um, uh, the vaccines um, in, in order to permit um, countries in the developing world to produce their own vaccines and not have to pay massive amounts of money to the large pharmaceutical Corporation. So there is a, a movement to do this um, in the UN that has not yet been supported by Canada. I would hope that Canada would move ahead on that, which is not like a specifically feminist thing, but it would be incredibly important, not just for, you know, women in developing countries, but for the whole world, because if we don't attack this issue of the spread of the vaccine variant soon, it will come back to bite us in Canada. So I think this is like one of the most crucial things that Canada could content, uh, currently be doing that other countries are pushing for right now. The virus is perhaps one of the clearest examples of um, issues that don't pay attention to borders. And so we really are on one tiny planet. I just want to offer um, Angela an opportunity to come in. We have a, a final question before uh, the wrap up. An interesting question about um, on the one hand, we want to measure the budget against Canada's stated goals of a feminist foreign policy, but an interest for receiving comments on whether the concept itself, uh, in light of our experience to date, is the most appropriate overarching concept. Uh, uh, is this a good frame for Canada's foreign policy effort? Do we want to keep a Canadian foreign policy, a foreign, feminist foreign policy as, as a frame? Um, and I know there's been a lot of examples from other countries around the world for that, including strong environmental ones. But to Angela, do you want to kick off comments on uh, whether you think it's a good frame for Canada more generally? Um, I, I, I think that there's there's pros and cons, right? I, I think that to to really shine a light on something and say that we are unapologetically feminist. And we are going to take this lens um, to things. Um, I think that that clearly is is a strength. 
on on the other hand, I think that our our feminist experience and and our current experience also tells us that that we very much need to take intersectional lenses into account, and that we cannot just take like one lens on on diversity issues. Um, so that we need to take um, in Canada like racialized perspectives, indigenous perspectives, um, and and somehow manage to bring these together. And then then beyond that, coming from a climate perspective, I think it's very clear that the climate movement, um, both in its um, science based as well as its youth mobilized um, dimensions, has has transitioned really to a climate justice perspective. So I think that to and and I think that from an international um, dimension that that brings us back to a rights-based agenda as as well, right? Where we have a well-developed international framework, which when you consider all the different rights, it is intersectional if you handle it right. And I would add that that climate and environment needs to be a foundational one um, in that perspective. Thank you, Angela. So really, how does a how does a feminist foreign policy need to take account of rights uh, of the environment and many other uh, key intersectional issues? I'm going to turn it over to uh, Roy Culpepper now uh, from the Group of 78 to offer some kind of concluding remarks about key themes you've heard um, and uh, your your own comments about the budget and its its uh, contributions or not to a feminist foreign policy. Roy? Thank you, Gary. Well, this has been an extremely rich discussion. Uh, there's been a lot said that is extremely helpful for our awareness and analysis of the budget. I share the view that the budget's hard to read, not just because of its length, because but because of its obf obfuscation with the numbers. We don't really know how much additional spending is taking place. Uh, it's uh, often a number that's uh, interpolated with other numbers, which include what's already being spent, which is deducted from the number that's being put forward. This is not very helpful for transparency and for understanding. Uh, so uh, that's one point. Another point is that um, so much of this budget is about two things. One is the early uh, childhood education and child care initiative, which as everyone on the panel has commented, is uh, extremely creditable uh, to the government and for women and for uh, employment and for recovery from the pandemic. Uh, so all of those things are, are good, and 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 certainly, uh, that's a very feminist uh, initiative. And of course, recovering from the pandemic itself uh, is a preoccupation of the budget, as you would have expected, and as it should be. But uh, that leaves all of the other areas, including the ones that are represented in our panel, uh, uh, whether foreign policy, defense, aid, or trade or environment, uh, rather bereft of. Uh, um, uh, information as to how much is being allocated, what's being done, what's new, what's just a continuation of the old. Um, all of those things are either muted or missing in action. Um, I, I think it was striking how many times um, in our discussion the um, conclusion or the recommendation arose from our speakers that uh, uh, we need a, a, a longer term reflective review of, in the case of aid, aid policy and our long term commitment to aid, where are we going, uh, what, what are our objectives, the same with our, our foreign policy, the same with our, our defense, same with our, our trade policy uh, in, in, a, in an era where a lot of things that were uh, up, uh, upturned by the Trump administration are now uh, being reallocated through uh, new measures uh, in, in the Biden administration. So we need to um, uh, have a, a deep rethink of uh, all of these issues. And as um, Angela has said, um, certainly the feminist uh, lens is one lens through which we should unapologetically look at what we're doing or not doing in each of these areas. But it sh should be done so in a, in a context where we're looking at it uh, as an intersectional approach to understanding our policy choices and priorities. Uh, so as we go forward, I, I would think that all of us have a lot of uh, our own work and reflection to do as to, first of all, 
what should the priorities be in each of our areas? Uh, what kind of budgetary resources do these call for? And what is the place of feminism and feminist objectives in, in looking forward and trying to reshape our priorities and our allocation of our budget res resources? I could go on, and I'm, I'm sure that the, all of us could have gone on for some time, but thank you. I'd like to conclude by thanking everyone who has um, helped to make this possible. First of all, um, it's been great working with the McLeod Group to co-host uh, this webinar. We had a record number of people uh, registered and, and even in participating. Uh, I, I'd like to thank Stephen and Peggy and Angela, Bianca and uh, Laura for being uh, such articulate and, uh, articulate and succinct speakers. Ma uh, Gowry, you were a fantastic uh, moderator steering us through a very tight uh, uh, timeline. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, our uh, executive secretary, Sarah Bowles, for being in the control room and helping uh, to run things uh, smoothly and on time. And finally, to all of the participants who logged in, I hope you found this um, uh, useful, informative. We welcome your uh, feedback. Uh, please email us and, and let us know uh, and if you have uh, suggestions for, for future webinars, uh, we'd like to know about that as well. So thank you all. Uh, stay safe and uh, be healthy. And thank you.